Hey everybody, uh, happy belated Halloween. Um, that's what uh, this is. It's closer to Thanksgiving, I know, but um, I don't have a uh, Thanksgiving uh, Bugs Bunny Looney Tunes special to review. But I do recall there being a special. Yes, the Creature Features special. That review. I didn't get that thing done. And uh, I do recall telling some of you that it would have to, it would have to wait until next year. But what happened was, I got a day off today, and I thought I'd spend an hour or two on it this morning. And it turns out here it is 6 p.m. And I don't know. I just got a bug up my butt, and I decided to do it. So here it is now for you. And uh, you know, it's I'm in the in the in the tradition of Thanksgiving. Um, you know, I've been doing these videos for about a year, and uh, I've had a, an amazing. Um, Amazing time of it, and the results are, are pretty uh, pretty nice. So I'm very thankful for all of you for making me uh, making me care, making me keep doing this thing. So that's my gift to all of you. I said I would have to wait for a year to do this review, and now you don't have to wait. So from me to you, the Bugs Bunny Creature Features review. Enjoy. It is one of the greatest epics of our time. The story of two brave heroes battling the odds against the most dangerous villains kill the wabbit, kill the wabbit. that ever walked the earth. That was the wabbit. Bugs Bunny Esquire, uh, to be exact. Don't miss this gut-wrenching drama. Of course you realize this means war. Filled with action and adventure. Run for the hills, folks, or you'll be up to your armpits in March. After the fall of the theatrical short in the 60s, the only place to see the original cartoons was on TV, and Chuck Jones brought them back to movie theaters in 1979 by incorporating several of the shorts he directed for Warners in his heyday, with new animation of Bugs in his mansion reflecting on a life spent making cartoons. This was the Bugs Bunny Roadrunner movie, a film he directed, and while Chuck is often credited with creating the format for what would later be called a paste-up feature, which is a movie that uses old cartoons and bits of new animation to make a feature-length story, it had been proven a few years prior to this film's release that a feature-length movie with the old shorts would be financially viable, as was the case with Bob Clampett's 1975 film Bugs Bunny Superstar. Also, the format had been used before with TV shows and specials. In fact, the first Halloween special to use the paste-up format was Bugs Bunny's howl o -ween special, directed by Dave DeTeej in 1977 and produced by Hal Gear for CBS. Regardless of quality, the format definitely predates Chuck's movie. But either way, the farther you get from the time frame those original cartoons were made, the harder it is to recreate, even with substantial budget, the level of quality met by those Golden Age films. So it's no surprise that these paste-ups aren't a thing anymore. Well, today, in honor of Halloween, we are going to look at one of the worst, and not by coincidence, one of the last, if not the last, paste-up feature, or in this case, paste-up special, it's Bugs Bunny's Creature Features. Yeah. What's up, Gax and Dockets? Trevor Thompson, the self-appointed Looney Tunes critic here, and it's Halloween, my favorite holiday. You might be saying, Trevor... What the actual darn is going on with your Halloween costume? Well, this is my slipshod tribute to Witch Hazel. Not my slipshod tribute to the late, great June Foray, however, because she's the one who voiced Witch Hazel and also countless other uh, cartoon characters over the years. She deserves a great tribute. Not a slipshod one. Damn, I love the word slipshod, apparently. So uh, if you want to see the non-slipshod tribute that I gave to Witch, uh, not Witch Hazel, but June Foray, uh, click up here. Slip shot. <laughs> but uh, this is my witch hazel costume. And um, before you judge, I defy any one of you to make a better costume than this one. A challenge that the internet, by the way, has not stood up to. Seriously, Google witch hazel costume right now. You won't find anything, but seriously, Google witch hazel costume right now. I'll wait. 
And don't send me this picture either. Yes, it is amazing. It is an amazing piece of sculpture, yes. But an amazing piece of sculpture does not a witch hazel costume make. Besides, the lack of effort on my part is appropriate for this review. As a pace-up special, Creature Features, it's the absolute best. The best at not even trying. This is the premise of Bugs Bunny's Creature Features. Bugs Bunny opens a door to outer space, where you see the floating heads of three cartoons you'll later on watch. It could be argued that this was an attempt to parody The Twilight Zone, but if it is, it's not immediately apparent. I've been a fan of The Twilight Zone for decades, yet the possibility that this was a reference to it only occurred to me upon the fifth viewing of this opening sequence. So you tell me how effective that parody is. There might not have been sufficient budget, sure, but it should be noted that right around the same time that this special was being made, Tiny Toon Adventures had parodied Rod Serling's intro to greater effect with the Acme Acres Zone. Also, I should apologize for the crudity of this footage. I didn't have time to build it to scale or to paint it. Please excuse the crudity of this model. I didn't have time to build it to scale or to paint it. It's good. Oh, thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you. But this footage is crude, and that's because, big surprise, I don't have a physical or digital copy of the official release of Bugs Bunny's Halloween hijinks. Bugs Bunny's Halloween hijinks is a direct-to-video release that combines Bugs Bunny's creature features with the previously mentioned and more competently handled Bugs Bunny's Halloween special. Although, why is it a surprise that I don't own a physical copy of it? It's crap. I mean... I don't own a physical copy of the bad stuff. AWAY! The point is, we don't have the best copy of this special. That's the bad news. The good news is, this special is special by name only. It's not special like the first time you watch E.T. It's special like Corky from Life Goes On. It's barely in existence and held together with proverbial scotch tape. But we have better versions of the cartoons featured in this special, so I've substituted the cartoons that are in the original copy of this paste-up with the higher quality versions we have in our library at Ferris Wheelhouse. Basically, that just meant cracking open our copy of Daffy Duck's Quackbusters, itself probably the most ambitious of the paste-up features, if not certainly the last. There's some debate as to whether or not there was a theatrical run for that one. Thus, it might not be accurate to call it a paste-up feature, but the budget for it was certainly of theatrical quality, and as such, the two shorts from it did enjoy a theatrical run, having been put into a package with a few feature-length movies that came out that year. In fact, not one, but two shorts were made specifically for it, much like Bugs Bunny's Looney Christmas Tales. That is where the comparisons end, by the way. The two new shorts in question for Quackbusters were The Duck's Resist and Night of the Living Duck, and both are creature featured in this special. The other one, shown first, was made at the same time the linking animation was made too, and it's called Invasion of the Bunny Snatchers. By the way, 10 years later, and before being cast in the Looney Tunes show, Lola Bunny did a porno version of this cartoon called Invasion of the Bunny Snatches. So, after the almost a Twilight Zone parody, with crappy television budget animation done by people who don't know much about perspective, good God, look at the door and the wall, they're both wrong. Just another sign that this is TV money. Whoever drew that background didn't have their fundamentals down and weren't ready for such an abstract shot, but I digress. Anyway. After that one legitimate piece of linking cell animation with a background that isn't a void, Seriously, you'll see what I mean as we go. We then move into the more competently produced, but still stingy television budgeted Invasion of the Bunny Snatchers. And by that I mean that the people working on it know what they're doing and how to pay tribute to these classic cartoons, but it's done with limited funds, which explains why it doesn't have that cinematic depth in the photographing of the cells and backgrounds that the original shorts had. Basically what I'm saying is that television killed in a lot of ways, the animated cartoon, and that's as real as I can be. The answer to the question that a lot of people have asked over the years, why are these older cartoons better looking, funnier, and more entertaining than the stuff being made today? And in a lot of ways, you can say that television is the reason. I mean, but that's a different rant for a different video. Maybe. There's true irony at play by having Invasion of the Bunny Snatchers featured in a paste-up. 
It's a cartoon about the superficial and sometimes corporate direction the characters are forced to go purely for financial reasons to the studio. It's a corporate takeover. You're despicable. Hostile or dead. And that's exactly why the pace of features exist in the first place. Chuck's Bugs Bunny Roadrunner movie was a cash grab, but it wasn't a cynical one. But there are also a finite number of cartoons that can be mined to make a two-hour movie or even an hour or half-hour long TV special, so eventually the integrity of the paste-ups is going to get pretty threadbare. And right at the end of that bare-threadedness is Creature Features, as cynical and weak a cash grab if ever there was one. And Bunny Snatchers is right at the beginning of it, a cartoon about the studio not caring about its classic characters. Yeah, folks, that's called irony. The cartoon begins with Bugs Bunny getting bothered by Elmer Fudd, who once again is sticking a rifle down his rabbit hole. After a high-paced version of their usual back and forth, it's revealed that Bugs is late because he has to get to Sam out in the desert. Similarly, Sam and Bugs go through the routine that we've seen from them before, and then Bugs runs off for a similar song and dance with Daffy. It's rabbit season! Duck season! Rabbit season! Duck season! Rabbit season! Uh, rabbit season! Duck season! Rabbit season! Duck season! It's duck season! And I don't care if the whole world knows it! One constant in all of these heckler villain scenarios are these weird glowing carrots. The same ones that we see in the opening titles, you know, they're floating in space. They're, they're just there when Bugs turns around. And the next day when he meets his friends again in their respective habitats, they look a lot different and they're tr preoccupied with trying to get Bugs to eat one of these creepy glowing things. Swing on one of these strange looking cowards, and all your troubles will be put to rest. Uh, thanks anyway. I'll stick to my own brand. So I ran. Ran. I knew old Sam wouldn't disappoint me. No, varmint! I don't want to massacre you! Now be a nice critter, and bring home one of these wild cactus carrots! This is the point when the cartoon achieves true satire. It's entertaining and funny all the way through, but it gets truly satirical when Bugs encounters the doppelgangers, because they're animated, barely, in a deliberately cheap style that directly mirrors hacky animation corner cutting and even a few Korean studio mistakes that aren't worth the money for reshoots. If nothing else, you have to applaud the bravery of this cartoon. To truly appreciate it requires a bit of work and knowledge on the part of the audience, and getting the studio to take risks with its classic characters doesn't happen often. I mean, it's Warner Brothers, not Disney. Seriously, the new Mickey shorts and that Ub Iwerks short that they, they put before Frozen, uh, 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 Get a Horse, those are just two examples of something that you're not going to ever see from the likes of Warners. A fresh take with new designs that honor the original shorts and an all-new short animated and released in the theaters in the traditional style. I know the new Looney Tunes show, a.k.a. Wabbit, I know that show is a contender for that former description, but the designs, unlike the Looney Tunes show, they rely more on current design fads than the actual principles of appealing drawing. Basically, noodle arms with no elbows. And you know, the Mickey shorts can get away with that kind of thing too, because they're taking from the old Ub Iwerks design, that rubber hose era. Instead of actually showing that they have a wrist and an elbow, their entire arm would be a rubber hose. <laughs> and you could use, you could do anything with that rubber hose. You could stretch the arm out a mile. You, you know, you can use his leg as a lasso. You can do all sorts of things with that kind of freedom. Yeah, it is a step backwards, but it's a neat little thing to do, like a nice little nod to the classics once in a while. Like the design of SpongeBob. He's, he's brilliantly designed and then they just, you know, they cheated and they gave him these little stringy arms. And But when everything is like that, everything is symmetrical, everything is noodly, there's no humanity in it. Plus those Mickey shorts are f***ing amazing. Anyway, I'm rambling. The point I'm trying to make in that pre-recorded voiceover, I mean that thing I just said out loud is this short is something of an achievement for taking such a critical stance especially since it went into production less than two years after Mel Blanc died 
Remember, the character's identities were still very much in his shadow at that time, and proof of that is in the voices. Speaking as I was of Wabbit and the Looney Tunes shows earlier, Jeff Bergman does Bugs and Daffy for those new shows, and much like he does for this short, but if you listen to both of them back to back, you can hear two very different respective performances. Trouble is, it's really duck season. It's a lie! It's rabbit season! Find a different best friend to go on that show. But I need you! I prize prizes above all else! Oh boy. Look, Doc, the internet ain't something you just hand over. Now, I grant you, there's almost a quarter of a century's time passed between the two productions, but then again, if you play Joe Alasky's Daffy from, like, two years ago and compare it to Daffy that he did, like, some 20 years before, it'll sound more or less exactly the same. But Bergman, it would seem, is doing a performance of the characters in the new stuff, whereas in Bunny Snatchers, he's more of a sound-alike for an iconic voice print. Nice to see him get to evolve. After all, Mel did. But with the studio situation being what it was in 1991, it was a very brave move to allow Greg Ford and Terry Lennon to poke fun at the way the studio had been treating the characters. This was the second time that they had made a cartoon that did this, the other one being Blooper Bunny, which showed the characters how they were depicted to the public versus how they actually are in the cartoons. It was very brave, and the cartoon itself was very funny. If you want to hear my commentary of that cartoon, click the screen now. I've often said, and will continue to say, that the Looney Tunes characters are so diverse that they don't play well together. They're too independent and adversarial, which is probably why the paste-up features and TV specials, for the most part, are crap. It's not just that the new animation isn't as good as the old animation. It's not just that Mel's voice isn't the same. Anyone that works with me should never get me riled. Oh, and uh, why not? Because I'm a split personality. That's why not. It's not just that the needle drop music isn't as good as Carl Stalling and Milt Franklin's scores. Granted, the lack of that stuff doesn't help, but at its core, a lot of the time, there's no good reason for all the Looney Tunes to get together. Not to sing Christmas carols, not to make a movie about King Arthur, not to play a basketball game for their freedom with Michael Jordan. The Looney Tunes aren't an extended family who love each other. In fact, if it's not a paste-up feature, the only time you see them huddled together and smiling is in posters, t-shirts, advertising, and even, sadly, on the cover of DVDs, VHS tapes, and Laserdiscs. But why put them together and happy like that? They're not the Muppets. They're not the characters in Star Wars, they're comic losers. Except for Bugs, Tweety, Speedy, and the Roadrunner, who are comic heroes. In fact, they're not even the Looney Tunes. You want to know what the Looney Tunes are? They're the cheaper of the two series that Leon Schlesinger produced independently and then sold to Warner Brothers, the other one being the Merry Melodies, which in the beginning were made essentially just to sell the music of the Warner Library. But no one calls the characters the Merry Melodies. No, that, that would be silly. But then they were put on TV and that was in high demand and then the demand for dolls and toys and crab grew to just astronomical levels and then they did the Bugs Bunny show and the next thing you know marketing is calling them the Looney Tunes and it's just TV killed it all man I'm telling you. So finally Bugs takes one of the weird carrots home albeit under protest and decides not to eat it until the morning but overnight the carrot grows impatient and also legs. Seriously. All right, not literally, but a doppelganger Bugs comes out of it and tries to kill him with an axe. It doesn't take long for Bugs to figure out what's going on. You know something, folks? This is the scariest part of the picture. And he decides that the best thing to do is get rid of the carbon copy, cheaply made insults, and maybe the originals would resurface. Again, that's great satire, kids. Mm. For a Looney Tune made without any of the original directors, writers, gag men, or artists, and at a time when the studio was still maybe a little bit overprotective of their characters, especially since Frizz and Chuck were both still alive, it's quite an achievement that this cartoon got to do some real stuff. All right, spoilers. But first, a word from our sponsor. After these messages, we'll be right back. Teresa's 
part of this good, nutritious breakfast. Billy Rabbit, tricks are for kids. What that rabbit needs is a trickier disguise. Hello? Hey, what's up, Doc? B -b Bugs Bunny? In, Poison, to help you get some tricks. Fruity tricks. Orange, lemon, grape. What? No carrot? Here. Have I got a disguise for you? Here's the plan. Will Bugs Bunny help the rabbit get some tricks? I beg your pardon. And now, back to Bugs Bunny and the Roadrunner. Next on Bugs Bunny's Creature Features... Uh, one second there, Mr. Wabbit. It does need to be mentioned, before we proceed into the Duxercist, that there is one other way Bugs Bunny's Creature Features compares to the original paste-ups. Like Chuck's Bugs Bunny Roadrunner movie and Frizz's Looney 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 Bugs Bunny movie, Creature Features only showcases cartoons directed by the director of the paste-up itself. Creature Features is, as was most of the new Looney Tunes animation in the late 80s and early 90s, directed by Greg Ford and Terry Lennon, and all three of the shorts on it are theirs too. Okay, Bugs, let's look at the second Ford Lennon cartoon in this Paste is Too Expensive, so let's use Tape Up Special. So do that, since you're probably not likely to explain how you're able to breathe in space. Next on Bugs Bunny's Creature Features... Daffy gets a supernatural lesson in dating do's and don'ts in the Duxorcist. Thank you, Bugs. So here's the deal with the Duxorcist. It's a parody of the Exorcist, mainly by name only. And Daffy is a paranormalist, which in the world of this cartoon is a totally normal thing. Super normal. Paranormal, even. Thank you. You're a great crowd. This cartoon, and the one after it, are a bit like Freeze Frame and The Fright Before Christmas, in that they were designed to be parts of a bigger picture, or paste-up, but could be used as standalone shorts also. Freeze and Fright were both made for Bugs Bunny's Looney Christmas Tales, and showed up on many different iterations on TV, such as The Bugs Bunny and Tweety Show, and Looney Tunes on Nickelodeon. The Duxorcist and the other one on Creature Features, Night of the Living Duck, also existed as standalone shorts despite being made for Quackbusters, but unlike the shorts made for the Christmas special, these were used in more than one paste-up. And why is all of this important, you ask? It isn't. But it does sort of inform why Daffy has a ghost-busting business in this cartoon, so I saved the rant. Daffy gets a call on a dark and stormy night from a cliché in distress. Actually, I'm pronouncing that wrong. It's not distress. It's distress. Distress right here. Hey, toots. Which dress you gonna wear when Daffy Duck, an admittedly good substitute for Bill Murray, if in fact they don't work on screen together? Uh, Mr. Murray, uh, something's really been bugging me. Yeah? Just how did you get here, anyway? Producer's a friend of mine, just had a teamster come and drop me off, you know. Uh-huh. Well, that's how it goes. Yeah, when a duck shows up, the stupa duck, <laughs> when he shows up, what dress you gonna put on? This dress. This. Remember, because before we were, we were doing a thing, uh, never mind, internet audience with your ADD. Moving on. The damsel in this dress the sexy one that makes him do a super tame Tex Avery take, is apparently having trouble with her kitchen appliances because she's possessed. No, really, that's, that's what the cartoon says, not me. See for yourself. I seem to be having trouble with my kitchen appliances. Listen, lady, this ain't no electricians. I never got the point of that premise, even when I was a kid. I mean, I didn't laugh at the jokes they made with it, but when I was a kid, if I didn't laugh at a joke, I just assumed that I didn't get it. Now, I don't really think there's anything to get, other than it's just bad writing. Let's unbox this. She sees his commercial for his paranormalist service, calls him immediately, while turning into a were-duck, and then says that she's having trouble with her kitchen appliances. Why? 
She knows she's possessed. She flips out. She saw the ad. And then when Daffy comes to her place, after telling her to put on a sexy dress, just slip into something out of this world and I'll be right over. He ignores her without making eye contact, does some jokes about the kitchen appliances, which, as it turns out, are indeed haunted. Then turns around to notice her in this dress that he told her to put on. And afterward, there's just a just a bunch of bad stuff about where like Daffy just barely missing the fact that she's possessed. And there's no longer any mention of the kitchen appliances. Daffy didn't cure them. He didn't exercise them. He just witnessed them so that the gags could play out. And then he left the kitchen. Now, it's sort of minor, but why do I bring it up? You're wondering. I bring it up. You're wondering because you can have crappy story setups with no real payoff if you're Tex Avery. His gags and jokes were so funny that it didn't really matter that they're not serving the story, but this isn't funny. Well, okay, there's one funny part. So, uh, tell me, my Fraulein, when did you start hearing these voices? Uh, was it uh, something in your childhood, perhaps? Buried deep in your subconscious mind? Search your memory. You're blocking! <laughs> this is a little over my head. So even though he doesn't do anything for her kitchen or her melodrama, courtesy of the great B.J. Ward, he does manage to exercise the demons right out of her, along with her L.A. accent. Oh, Daffy, I'm so scared, and it's so comforting to have a short, dark, handsome duck like you to protect me. You will help me, won't you? Apparently, the sultry Santa Monica speak was a work of the devil, and now she can go back to being a southern belle. Mm -mm, what? Oh? Huh? Why, well, I feel like my old self again. But Daffy's not mindful and leaves his back to the spirits too long, and they jump into his body instead. So he runs off into the hills with borrowed screams and woo-woos from Mel Blanc's younger days. <laughs> so yeah, that's the cartoon, and it's lukewarm at best, especially since they didn't take full advantage of some of the comic possibilities that that cartoon had. Like all the stuff with the damsel getting demonic and angry. Too bad they didn't do a period joke. You know, because... It's The Exorcist, the movie, it's from the 70s, that was a whole different period. Plus, Daffy could say, Possession? That's the 70s, that's shag carpeting. And then she could be like, I thanks, but I know what year it is. And he could look at the camera and be like, and I know what month it is. Or more important, what time of the month it is. October. Late October. See, it's Halloween joke. And it doesn't need to be Halloween for me to hear boo. Yes, well, I apologize for those jokes. Women roll. Actually, the voice of this character is a legend in animation, the great B.J. Ward. She's been working up until 2016 and might still be, but she got her start in 1960. In fact, the first credit on her IMDb page is The Bugs Bunny Show. And lastly, we are at the last cartoon. At last. Say last one more time, you fat witch. But first, you need to watch this. Your attention, please. For the first time ever on network television, the following cartoon will be presented in Screamo Vision. A byproduct of Holland's vast tulip industry, Screamo Vision heightens your viewing experience by prompting you when to scream. Let's try it now. Scream. <laughs> Good. And now we proudly present the following cartoon in Screamo Vision. Eh. Next, The Night of the Living Dog. The story of a little black dog who learns that reading too many comic books can lead to monstrous consequences. Scream. <laughs> so before we get started, here's a nice little in joke. Bob Givens, despite having his name misspelled, is mentioned and caricatured in this magazine cover. Bob Givens was a storyboard artist, among other things, at Warner's back in the day, and if you want to watch a great video, seek out Bob Givens, Grand Old Man of Animation. Anyway, the intro continues. 
Daffy, perhaps for the first time since the Great Piggy Bank robbery, is depicted in this cartoon as being a comic book nerd. The premise for this cartoon is a lot simpler than the Duxorcist, and as a result, it's a better cartoon. So Daffy's in his nerdily decorated room, reading about Schmodzilla in the comic book Hideous Tales. It's obviously a reference to Godzilla, which, while there are indeed Godzilla comics out there, he's not known for being a comic book character, so I don't know why Schmodzilla is... Uh, whatever. So Daffy does something he hasn't done in a long time in this cartoon. Said something with a lot of S's so that he can spit a lot. It's slopping over with gripping suspense. So he continues reading aloud, to nobody, only to find that the story is continued in a different issue. While frantically searching for Hideous Tales number 177, and yes, I know that that's the issue, and not because I looked it up or made notes while I was watching this, no. I know that because I have seen this cartoon so many bleeding times that it was just, it's just in my head forever. The the way Mel did it, just the sing-songiness of it. Story continued in Hideous Tales 177. Story continued in Hideous Tales, issue number 177. Story continued in Hideous Tales 177. Story continued in Hideous Tales 177. 177. 177. Hideous Tales 177. Just, you know. Mel was the best. Gee, that's nice. So yeah, while searching for Hideous Tales issue number 177, he gets clunked on the head by an out-of-the-box Schmodzilla clock. Out as he is clunked, Daffy immediately dreams he is a performer in a nightclub for monsters. You know, like you do. Now, we're about to get into the central conceit for this cartoon's existence. The vocal performance by Mel. Not blank, but Torme. Me, 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 do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. Hmm. Hey, this stuff works great! Take it, ghoulie. They're drenched in blood or caked with mud you yell and scream when one of them arrives There is no denying Monsters lead such interesting lives they Melvin Howard Mel Torme was a jazz singer and composer, popular from the 40s to the 70s, and the guy who composed and originally sang the Christmas song, a.k.a. Chestnuts Roasting on an Open Fire. In the 80s, he did a lot of self-referential jobs, like this cartoon, and played himself like nine times on Night Court. The sad thing about this is that there isn't much information available about Torme's involvement in this cartoon. I can only imagine that the reason it's not in like an interview somewhere is because the details of it are as mundane as, who can we get that has an iconic voice? What about Mel Torme? Perfect, let's see if we can get him. We can, good, let's use him. And then, after Torme's great song, which he played piano for, by the way, and it's also available for purchase on Amazon via his album Mel Torme at the Movies. But anyway, after that song, which, in addition to being good on its own merit, also acts as a great delivery system for a number of visual gags, Daffy starts to do something that a lot of us stand-up comedians have to learn how to do. A dreadful process known as crowd work. So, are you folks enjoying yourselves? <laughs> Hiya, Frankie. How's the missus? <laughs> and this is a real thing, too, folks. Every comic out there, myself included, has had to deal at least one time in their career with a monster in the audience who doesn't like it when the jokes are about them. <laughs> Baby, leveled any major cities lately? You know, folks, Schmodzilla is just like any unemployed actor, except that when he pounds the pavement, it registers a 10 on the Richter scale. Once again, Daffy expresses fright by playing recordings of himself yelling from 40 years before. <laughs> Whew, 
A dream. It was all a dream. Daffy used to read Word Up magazine. Why not? He is black, and that would explain why Donald called him the N-word. Again, Roger Rabbit and this cartoon were made around the same time. Yet the audio guys at ILM did a much better job of getting Mel's Daffy to sound like Daffy than Warner Brothers did. This means war. <laughs> Schmodzilla. You were expecting maybe Kelvin Coolidge. Well, that is the last cartoon in Bugs Bunny's Creature Features. So that means, in paced up fashion, that there, we're going to see all new animation from here on out. So, let's see how they end it. Guess what, folks? It's over. <laughs> That's it? That's horrible. And not Halloween horrible either, just, just horrible. And it's clear that this was made for this special because if you look at it, you can see characters from all three cartoons. So it is deliberate, but it doesn't even make continuity sense. The damsel duck. The damsel duck is there with the ghosts that possessed her in the first place and later jumped into Daffy. But then, she freaks out and turns into Demon Duck. But the ghosts are right there in front of her! Daffy exercised the demons and cured her, bringing back her never-before-heard Scarlet O'Hara voice. So, so she's cured. But then she gets demonic when the ghosts are in front of her? Is, is it becoming more and more clear that this special is the worst of them all? And... If there's no more paste-ups after this special, can we really say why not? Well, yes, but it doesn't really apply to you now, does it, honey? But there is a weird kind of story about all of this, though. It's not hokey, it's not a ghost story, but it is unexplained. The unknown whereabouts of animator Brenda Banks. Brenda Banks, by some accounts the third female black animator ever, worked on The Duxorcist and Night of the Living Duck. The legend about her, although it hasn't been confirmed, is that one day she walked into the Bakshi studio during production of Wizards and asked to be an animator without ever having worked before or gone to school. Ralph, allegedly, gave her a job animating the goons, figuring that if she couldn't do them, she wouldn't be able to do anything else for the movie and he ended up being amazed by her raw talent. But it becomes a legitimate mystery when she gets to King of the Hill. She had a fairly good career as an animator and character designer for Saturday Morning Cartoons for a full decade after Wizards. She worked on The Simpsons video games and the show itself, and then she worked as a layout artist and character designer on King of the Hill for eight years until 2005. But that's the last anyone has seen of her. Nobody knows if she's dead or just decided to be a trailblazer in some other profession, but it is a legitimate mystery. The cartoon slash comic blog Skunk and Burning Tires has posted some information and the only known picture of her in the hopes that someone may know something, somewhere. The post is two years old and a lot of people have reposted it, but to date, no one in animation has heard anything. So please, her story needs to be told, her praises need to be sung, and if something bad happened to her, the assailant needs to be brought to justice. Now, I know that's not the brightest tone to end this review on, so I'll leave you guys with this. It turns out that we do know how Mel Torme got involved in working on Night of the Living Duck. I mentioned earlier that he appeared multiple times on Night Court. Well, there's your link. You see, folks, one day, while shooting one of his many cameos as himself on Night Court, Mel lamented between takes that he never got to work with any of the comedy greats of his day. And that's when John Larroquette said to him, Well, Mel, the Looney Tunes are still alive. I know, because I just shot a series of commercials with them for Holiday Inn. You know, it's really great. They're all old school, real nice, the pay is good. But stay away from the one with the sombrero. Gonzalez, stay away. Come on, Speedy! <laughs> You know why they call him Speedy? Because they couldn't call him Meth Head Mouse. Next thing you know, Torme's agent is on the phone with the animation department, and this is the result. 
See, there's a happy ending after all. And if it wasn't spooky enough for you, try staying at a Holiday Inn for a night without getting bitten. Only bugs I want in my bed is this guy right here. Well, happy Halloween, everybody. That's the review. I'll see you next time for the Lunatics Unleashed review. And until then, I'm Trevor Thompson, the self-appointed Looney Tunes critic. And that's all, folks. <laughs>